Um, okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Good idea? Good idea. Not because we have to, because we get to. All right. Heavenly Father, um, thank you that you are a God who loves us. Thank you that you are a God who loves the Son, who loves the Spirit, and they all love each other, and there is perfect love in the middle, and you have invited all of us into that love. Wow. That's your purpose for us. Period. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the finished work of the cross. Thank you for willingly going there and doing what we could never possibly do. Teach us how to stop trying to do things for you in an effort to gain your acceptance, but instead believe we are accepted and respond the rest of our lives that way. There's so much to learn, and religion has caused lies to enter our minds, and there's so much more to unlearn. Be our teacher. Be our revealer. Be our sustainer. Be the one who walks through difficult days with us. You did not promise that we would avoid hardships. You did not promise we would avoid pain. You did promise you'd walk through it with us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that assurance. Father, for Hope Fellowship, may we continue to grow in our knowledge and understanding of your divine love for us, your divine acceptance, knowing that we are completely and absolutely valued by you. Amen. Philippians chapter 4. This is an awesome, awesome book. I hope you've had a chance to read through or jump ahead and, and dig in a little bit, um, or at least go online and catch up to what we've been talking about, because it's a, a really cool theme here. This is a book called Philippians, and it deals with our source code. Who is your source? If you think you are your source, some old philosophy says, I think, therefore I am, led us down a wrong path a long time ago. It is a lie. Because it makes you the center of the universe. But when we recognize our source code... That Jesus Christ is our DNA now. We are fused in union with Jesus. We must know this. Anybody who does not will spend the rest of their life finding coping mechanisms to find a way to get their needs met. Try to find a way to get that fusion with their creator and they may not even know they're desiring that. But God built into you already the desire, the want to, the capacity to know him. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a hunger for it. Some are blind to that hunger. And God will wake them up. Who is your source code? In a computer. If you have wrong programming put into a web page, oh my goodness, you got wrong stuff showing up or things not working quite right. Or if you're in a network... Or whatever, I'm not that computer smart, but some of you guys know this stuff. If you put the wrong programming in, whatever wrong stuff you put in is exactly what comes out. But if you have correct programming, when you know you are one with Christ, and you believe it, then you begin to produce the fruit of that knowledge of truth. His name is Jesus. He is your source code. He is your joy. And this book talks a lot about joy as well. We're going to take a look at uh, verse 10, but I want to jump back to two things that I, I ended last week on. Loving others, getting along with others. There's two key points that I really missed, and I, I thought, oh, how could I have forgotten those two? Those are like great ones. So I'm going to give them to you. Is that all right? All right. Do you remember we talked about getting along with others? Matthew 18, go first to your person that you're upset with in private. And then out of Philippians, we see there's actually an initial step that happens ahead of that, that Paul gives us, about pray and know him first. Do you remember that part? Here's point number one that I missed. Before you can confront someone you have trouble with, biblically, you must love them 
first. You have to love them first. Because if you don't, you are not going to them in love, but in vengeance. Trying to correct them or pay them back or reveal their flesh so they feel even crappier about themselves or make you feel better about, them yourself, about yourself. If you don't first love them, you should not confront them. Therefore, you pray for them and yourself. Father, you love them, but I got some blindness in me that can't love them right now, so please change my heart towards them. Because the goal of all of confrontation fixing is reconciliation and building them up in Christ. It's critical. You'll see a whole lot less fighting in churches if people listen to this. Really. Because it isn't about you anymore. This is about Jesus. Orchestrating. He is the conductor of this orchestra in front of me. See, sometimes you think you're the audience. Right? Yeah, we're sitting in the audience. Of course we're the audience. You know, speak because we're, we're here to listen. Uh-uh. Do you realize it is you who is on stage? All of you are actually the stage. The Holy Spirit is the one. They're watching your hearts and what he's doing in you. I'm just a prompter. That's it. Hopefully the Holy Spirit uses me. But he's watching your hearts. You're not here just to sit and watch and, yeah, it was good. I'll throw that in like that. Okay, uh, I'll give him a four out of ten today. You know? <laughs> Whatever. This is about you growing in your relationship with God. Not discovering it. Not trying to make it better. Because how do you make it better? That could imply self-effort. When you know you're one with Papa, unfortunately, that can take a long time to fully and intimately believe. Because the fruit of that belief will radically change your attitudes. And there's no way to perfect it in human strength. All of us are going to screw up at times. You know, try parenting. <laughs> try working at a job where you can't stand your boss. Try acting good as best you can. Guess what your focus will be? Trying to act good. What's your natural response here at Hope Fellowship? Wrong tree. You're not called to act good or bad. You're called to let Christ live through you. That requires intimacy with your Heavenly Father. So love people first. In the book of Matthew, Jesus makes the little list. Go to them first. If they don't listen, go to the church, blah, 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 whatever it is there. And then he says, if they still don't listen, after you've done the whole list, treat them like a what? Tax collector and a pagan. Oh, man, the religious church loves that one. How does Jesus treat a tax collector and pagan? This is not the call to treat them like crap. This is the call to love them with the love of the Lord that you can't possibly love with outside of Christ. This means to be extra gentle, extra loving, does that make sense? I used to read into it. Oh, treat him like a tax collector and pagan. Kick him out of the church. What? Where does it say that? I'll tell you this. Paul does talk about setting people outside so they can see the misery of non-connection for those who refuse to listen. But to treat people like tax collectors and pagans? means to love them more and more. Be more and more gentle. And this will change the heart. This, again, it all boils down to love. You can't love until you know you are loved. Because then you have something to love others with. Because man-made love falls short every time. It's conditional. If you do this, then I'll do that. God's love is, I'm going to love you like crazy. In fact, I was loving you before you even knew I existed, and I'm going to go to the cross and take care of this hindrance called sin, this blindness, 
that has hindered you since the fall in the garden, I'm going to take care of it. You can't. And he does it. That's love. We love because what? He first loved us. This is how we get along, and they'll know we're Christians by our doctrine. <laughs> they'll know we're Christians by our love. Not our location, church size, programs, what we're good at, great advertising, all that stuff. No, no, no. <whistles> Completely by love. Folks, this is the most important message God has for you. To know you're loved. Once you know you're loved, now love others. It's a powerful journey. Paul has experienced this. He just finished talking to the Philippians. The beginning of chapter... Four, he, he pleads that two women get along. That's what we talked about, getting along. It was kind of cool. But then he comes to something very, very neat. And I like this part. All right, let's, let's show the text. Verse 10, he writes, I, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. What happened here? Why is he saying this? Well, Paul went, fell off the face of the radar. Two years they couldn't find him because he was in jail. He was a con. Okay? So they had no way of connecting with him. He knew that. In his loving response, he says, Hey, you've revived it because you had no chance. You didn't even have the opportunity to connect with me. I love you guys for it. This is an emphatic love letter, love section to the church. This is critical. They participated with him in the work. Paul did not do this stuff on his own. He says, not that I speak from want, for I have... Oh, sorry. But you were concerned before, but you've lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Ooh. Can we say that? <laughs> are you, uh, can you say you are content in every single circumstance? In my flesh, there is no way that I am. All right? And we're still learning not to listen to flesh, which is not our identity. Our identity is the life of Christ. And the more you know you're loved, you're going to recognize that voice, and you don't hear the flesh speaking to you. You don't hear the power of indwelling sin speaking to you anymore, mm -hmm. which has no power in you anyway except to lie. That's it. He says this, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Wow. Ever hear of uh, Harry Ironside? An old writer, theologian, teacher? Listen to this. Vernon McGee writes, it was the custom of Dr. Harry Ironside to go every year to Grand Rapids for a Bible conference at Mel Trotter's mission. Mel Trotter had been an alcoholic, and after he had come to Christ, he opened a mission to reach other men who were his, in his former condition. The owner of a hotel, which had just been built in Grand Rapids, had been an alcoholic and had been led to Christ by Mel Trotter. He told Mel, hey, when you have a speaker or visitor come to your mission, send them over to the hotel and we'll give them free, uh, a free rooming, no charge. When Dr. Ironside arrived at the hotel, the man ushered him up to the presidential suite. He had the best apartment in the hotel. Dr. Ironside had never been in a place like that before. He called Mel on the phone and said, Listen, Mel, you don't have to put me up like this. I don't need all this luxury. All I want is a room with a bed and a desk and a lamp where I can study. Mel assured him that the room was not costing him or the mission anything. It was being provided free of charge. And he said, Harry, Paul said he knew how to abound and he knew how to be abased. Now you learn about this. This week, Harry Ironside had to learn how to live in abundance. Twist my arm. <laughs> Anybody want to, you know, gift that? Uh, <laughs> Are you satisfied with what you have? Or have you been caught up in the culture of more, 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 give me more, more, yeah. 
Really, you may not look like crazy, but inside you could be going, yep, that would be good. Yep, I'll just quietly do this. I'll, you have the Christian way of wanting more. <laughs> Are you satisfied with your lot? Is God able to use what you have in your life? Because this church gave to him generously. And for two years, they weren't able to because they couldn't find him. Who's hiding in a jail? Well, locked away to jail. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. He is telling them something very, very powerful. It is Christ's strength that strengthens him. He does not have any real power in and of himself. There is no life apart from Christ at all. And with you and I to know this and realize that it is the strength of Christ that is our strength. So to say, I got to get stronger for God. No, you need to allow his strength to flow through you better and better. It may look like you're getting stronger. But know the truth. Know the source code. He is the source of any strength, inspiration, thought pattern that bears fruit for him. He's it. And he's gifted every single one of you with unique gifts. A source code built into you and your DNA to bring glory to him. And he wants you to use it. Here at Hope Fellowship, or whatever ministry you support, you participate in the fruit and joy and furtherance of that ministry. Paul writes, you shared with me in my affliction. They gave generously. Their language was money. Paul did not ask for money. Others did. It doesn't make it more right. It doesn't make it more wrong. Well, it's more holy to not ask. Who says? Put the need out there. It's okay. This church family, when you support, do you realize you participate in everything that happens in all areas, including the growth of those children as they grow spiritually? In everything you do. Oh, I thought my five bucks kind of pays for the whole electricity bill. Who are you kidding? How many of you have... Uh, uh, Ontario or uh, Waterloo North Hydro bills. And what's the other company that does hydro? Kitchen Wilmot. Okay, all of you have bills? Do you pay them every week? A month? Yes. Or bi monthly, whatever it is. You pay them regularly. Yes. Oh, I say you wouldn't look a, yeah, I, I, you can tell if you don't. <laughs> How about gas, natural gas? You pay it regularly. Do you have a car? You put gas into it. Does it work when the gas is in it? And if there's no gas in it, it what? You're then you're dumb. Get a cab. <laughs> this is the cab speaking. <laughs> you should have said cab. <laughs> okay, there, there is a principle, a law of putting into and coming back. And Paul saw something in this church that he had not seen anywhere else. I'll use an illustration my wife talked to me about, and that was the living with open hands. Many of us live with our finances and our belongings like this. Oh God, use me. That'd be awesome. <laughs> now pray, oh God, use me. That would be awesome. And he can take out of your hand and put into your hand as he chooses. For when you hold tight, you're really not that strong. God can <laughs> do whatever he wants. But the idea, the mental image of freedom to allow the flow of God's resources to flow through you. Everything God gives you is not for you to keep. It's to give away. Some people have said we should go back to the old tithing law, which we don't teach you because it's not a law you and I are under. 
We are not to tithe anymore. If we did, uh, we'd have a whole bunch of other rules to suddenly add in. It wouldn't look really pretty. If you want to go to the Old Testament law, that means you actually end up giving but 29 to 32% of your income. Wouldn't that be cool? How many want to vote right now for that switch? <laughs> that system was flawed. With open hands, the new covenant is this. Listen carefully. It's 100%. All that God has provided you in income, in home, in vehicles and things, it's all His. It is not yours. And God may inspire you to be far more generous than you am because you've been living like this. He may show you that he wants to fund something through you. He may want to use your gifts and talents through you. Not everybody can give financially. This is not a tithing sermon today. I was, I was going to touch on that, but this is about a giving church. And I'll, I'm going to save a, a... I want to teach on grace giving it so, uh, soon. I just think it's important for us to visit that again. But here we have an example of what the fruit of grace giving looks like. They participated with him in the message. Listen to this. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. There's something here I don't fully understand, folks. Some people think they absolutely understand this. I don't get that either. But there's something at work here that when you participate in, there's something that comes back. Mm -hmm. Lori and I have been married for almost 22 years. This October will be 22 years. And we have seen God do some wild, funky stuff. And we're not into health and wealth at all. We're into knowing the wealth of God as he chooses to displace it in us and through us. We've never been without. We've, he, he seems to provide, listen to this, he provides our needs when we need it. And there were times when we felt he didn't provide, but we didn't need that because he had something else going on and dominoed, and now 22 years later, hindsight's 2020, and I see God has been in perfect control the whole time. We give regularly and generously. That's not why God does it. Don't think, oh, if I give, God will bless me. He does. But not because. And yet, he does because. Does that make sense? That's all I can say. He does. Don't be a cheap Christian. Don't see for yourself only, this program isn't working for me, I'm going to quit. We don't have anybody that uh, broadcasts their giving and uses it as a threat. I've been to churches where, well, we give so much a year, and if you don't change that bylaw, we're going to stop our giving or give it all the missions. <laughs> what? See the control? It has nothing to do with God. Between you and Papa, the only principle I see and command in the New Testament is listen to the Holy Spirit and do what he says. He tells you how much to give. I'm allowed to ask. As your pastor, this is my living, folks. You guys have other jobs I can't do. This is my job. To minister to you, to pastor, to do all these things. And I'm allowed to ask to eat from what you do. So please, participate. Mm -hmm. So I can forget the thinking of stress. That's right. I don't want to think about it. Mm -hmm. But I've been thinking about it. I don't want to. It's a flesh pattern. I'm, I'm learning to trust God. Jen is a great balance for me. <laughs> she corrects me often. <laughs> <laughs> but it means I get to, in love, say, folks, support don't forget, you are a participant in all that happens here and beyond. That's right. 
Don't be cheap. God's not cheap. Live like this and watch God change everything you do and how you give. We don't give just to Hope Fellowship. We've got other things we give to. This is where I eat spiritually, so I'm going to give here for sure. Some churches teach you must give to the church first. I can't say that. I can say you eat here, support here. And I have other things God's given me to support. It has fruit and goes on. But he says, but I seek for profit which increases your account. He's thinking of the benefit and the account of those who gave and seeded into, I hate that word, but it's all that came to my mind, seeded into that ministry, to what Paul was doing. How would you like to have been a supporter of the Apostle Paul? I helped pay for that. <laughs> Is that funny? I think it's funny. All right, never mind. <laughs> but I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Aphrodite what you have sent, a fragrant aroma and acceptable sacrifice while pleasing to God. Do you realize that the priest had to go into a temple in the Old Covenant and burn up incense, and it was a fragrant aroma to God? And you hear their sacrifices. They sacrificed giving, and that became a sweet aroma to Paul and to all that he was doing. The unbelievable, unbelievable freedom. And listen to this. And my God might supply all your needs according to his poorness in glory in Christ Jesus. Is that what it says? No. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches. How rich is he? Crazy rich in Christ. In glory in Jesus Christ. Wow. Are you your God? Are you your provider? Do you live like this with your belongings, with your money, with your relationships? Folks, I saw something this week that kind of blew me away. And I get to see it all the time, but somehow this particular funeral impacted me. When you die, you're dead. It's really true. <laughs> all right? And all that's left in memory of those you connected with is your relationships. Not churchianity. Not the programs. But your connections with one another. I said at the end of the one funeral, so I didn't hear one iota about, I'm so glad the guy worked overtime. We didn't see him. Made lots of money, bought the stuff, worked overtime. None of that didn't happen. Instead, only words of sacrifice, character, relationship, bonding. Folks, that is the picture of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost blended together in the most powerful, loving relationship ever. And if that's the Trinity, and we're invited into it, then you and I also have a supernatural DNA response to love others and know people. Some of us are afraid to because we have a lot of baggage from the past. May Papa begin to heal you right now and release you from that so you can begin to experience the relationships you were intended to experience. Closeness, freedom with one another. And now, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory be to him. He's your source code. Is this your church family? No people here then. Support it. Pray for it, as Papa tells you to pray. And know you are loved. That's my prayer for you guys. I pray for you guys all often. That the love of God will permeate your minds. Get your eyes off of all your behaviors. And on to his love. Real healing starts there.
Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace is a person named Jesus. You're one with him. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's promised that. So you've got a seriously tight relationship. I need that security in my mind. I need that confidence. May his confidence be yours. May the revelation of his pure, unconditional love for you become real to you. That's my prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the letter to Philippians from Paul that you wrote through him. There's so much there to take in. So I pray that you speak to each person here. What is it you are saying to each person? Because it's going to be different for most of us. Make us teachable, not gullible. Keep us humble. May we learn to listen to your voice and not the voices of right and wrong, not the voices of morality because you supersede all those. We are now under the law of the life of Christ Jesus in us. Teach us how to live under that, by that, through that, and from that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.